All right. Welcome to another episode of BHBA Family Law Presents Direct Examination with Dan and Lauren. Along with Lauren Youngman from Youngman Reichstein, I'm Dan Bemmel, financial advisor and certified divorce financial analyst. During each episode of our show, we'll explore our guest's personal and professional history and dig into a meaningful legal topic. Our upcoming guests, always on the first Wednesday of the month at 1230, will be Ann Kylie in June, Judge Riff in July, and Dana Lowy and Doreen Olson in August. The sign-up links are available in the chat box and on the bar calendar. Lauren. Thanks, Dan. Uh, you will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Please take a moment to complete the survey that's included with your certificate. Program materials were emailed to you, and you can find a link to the materials in the chat as well. The Family Law section is sponsored by Soberlink, White Zuckerman, Morsovsky, Luna, and Hunt, and Our Family Wizard. Soberlink system combines a portable breathalyzer with wireless technology. Trusted for use in child custody cases since 2011, Soberlink is the only system that combines court admissibility in all 50 states in Canada, facial recognition and tamper detection, real-time results, and easy-to-read advanced reporting. Trust the experts in remote alcohol monitoring technology for your custody cases involving alcohol. White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt provides a wide variety of resources to complete almost any project, large or small. They also provide traditional accounting and tax practice services. We invite you to contact them to discuss your specific accounting needs and learn how they can be of service to you. Our Family Wizard is a secure co-parenting platform that supports divorced or separated parents in managing the daily responsibilities of raising children. Specialized features help co-parents organize routines, share files, track expenses and payments, check in at exchanges, send messages and more, all while thoroughly documenting their activity. All right, that's it from our sponsors and we can begin the program. Dan. All right, let's get to it. Uh, as you all know, today we're talking to a true legend in the field Judge Thomas Trent Lewis, a longtime attorney, jurist, supervising judge for the Family Law Division, and now a highly sought after mediator and neutral. Judge Lewis is known for his deep engagement and commitment to both the advancement of law and the advancement of our community. We're going to explore his career path, the evolution of domestic violence law, and more. Uh, first, Judge Lewis, thank you so much for joining us. Well, and thank you, uh, Dan and Lauren, and thank you to the Beverly Hills Bar Association, and also many thanks to the sponsors of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, because the truth is that bar associations rely heavily on their sponsors, and it's a blessing to the bar that it has such good sponsors along the way, and it's an honor for me to be uh, asked to do the direct examination, and I promise to do my best to answer unless I don't like the question, and then I'll answer the question I want to answer, but I'm very <laughs> honored to be here today. Thank you. That's a deal. That's a deal. And there is so much we want to cover. But let's start out with I which I know is the most important question. Uh, how did you develop such a keen fashion sense and personal style? Where the heck did that come from? Well, um, it could be uh, as a result of having managed a clothing store in Hollywood uh, in the 1969-1970 uh, era. So uh, I was kind of a fashionista. Uh, I left school, went to work there. Uh, when I was in high school, I was very upset about the fact that men were not allowed to wear uh, uh any, they weren't allowed to wear t-shirts. Uh, uh, women's students were not allowed to wear pants. Uh, men's, now, now this part is no problem for me. Men's hair could not touch the top of their ear. And uh, so I helped kind of lead a revolt amongst the students about uh, uh, dress and fashion. And I've always kind of just been a guy that thinks uh, if, you, if you look good and you feel good, then you're going to do good. And I think that the uh, tip I would have for anybody that asked, if you don't feel comfortable in what you're wearing, it doesn't matter how expensive it is, you're never going to look good. If you feel good, then you're going to look as good as you can look. 
And for me, that's not very far to go, but at least uh, uh, we can make an improvement in our appearance. Go back to that. You, I mean, I don't want to gloss over this. You said yeah. there was a minor student revolt. I know you went to high school at Taft. Can you? I did. You walk it. Uh, tell. I mean, I, I walked I, the line I, at Taft. Yeah, I almost yeah. got suspended. I was almost suspended uh, because I uh, felt that it was unfair. I wanted to have a student protest. Uh, I wanted us to not go to school for a particular day. I was brought into the vice principal's office. Well, the dean of boys, if you will, Mr. Pettit, uh, that's 1968. So he's still near and dear to me. Uh, he told me if I continued on that they were going to go ahead and suspend me from school for inciting uh, a riot, if you will. It was hardly a riot. Um, the principal, very smart guy, Dr. Olmsted, brought me into the office and said, Tom, what would you think if we put you in charge of leading a commission to look at the dress code? And I said, well, that would be great. And of course I went to, I graduated from high school in 68. So as I'm getting ready to graduate, um, Martin Luther King gets killed. As I'm getting ready to graduate, uh, Bobby Kennedy gets killed. So it was a very difficult time socially. Uh, and, um, you know, young people were looking for ways to express themselves. And we just thought that the dress standards were unfair. I thought it was genius move on Dr. Olmsted's part to say, how about if we put you in charge of leading an examination into the dress code? And um, so I was honored to get to do that. They didn't change the dress code while I was there, of course, because we really didn't get started until about April. Graduation was in June. And, um, but it, by the following year, they did change the dress code standards for better or worse. One might argue the way kids dress at school today, but um, it was important to us uh, to have an opportunity to express some individualism. And eventually that was recognized by the school. And, and so after uh, you read, led your revolt, <laughs> then uh, joined, the, uh, joined the program to make perform you graduate, did you go straight to college or is that when you went to work at the clothing store? No, I went to college. I did a semester at San Diego State. And then, um, you know, uh, I was also involved in a lot of student protests back then. I'm sure that it would be interesting reading to go to the Freedom of Information now and ask the FBI for the file on me, but it never came up in my judicial application. Uh, but I, I know I was at a lot of events where guys were wearing suits the color that I'm wearing, but very skinny uh, white ties and with cameras, you know, uh, real film cameras taking pictures of the students. So uh, I just felt that I knew everything. I was disenfranchised. I felt because of the political atmosphere uh, and I left school. And then that's when I went to work in the clothing business. And I went back to school in uh, 1972. What prompted you to go back to school? Well, um, I was making very good money working as a manager of a clothing store. Uh, we were uh, two doors, three doors down from Cantor's and across the street from the Free Press Bookstore, kind of at Melrose and Fairfax. A block and a half away is Fairfax High School. And my hair was led literally down to here. It was a little shorter than Lauren's hair and very blonde and, uh, and really blonde, uh, not store-bought like later in my life. And uh, want evidence to back that up. <laughs> uh, you know, I, there is evidence to back that up, but you have to email me and uh, you'll have to share something that you don't want to go public. And then I'll show you a picture <laughs> of me with long hair. Um, uh, and so I decided uh, that, Gee, is this it? Most of my peers were managing stores all throughout Southern California. And, you know, we were making good money, uh, but I thought, is this it? And uh, so I, I decided that I needed to go back to school, get my education. So I started at junior college, Pierce Junior College, graduated with honors from UCLA, uh, went on to law school. And then uh, the rest, I guess, is more or less known. But anyway, let me answer your next question. So, so let's talk about that, that jump from, sure. I think all of us uh, had that moment, right? Where you're getting towards the end of college and we all decided at some point to go to law school. What was that uh, moment? What was that catalyst for you that kind of launched your, your trajectory into the law itself? Well, blessed to have parents that were very supportive, that accepted their prodigal son back uh, into their lives. 
And um, uh, my mom, who has since passed away, God rest her soul, uh, encouraged me that, you know, you are so argumentative. Look at all the trouble. I mean, look at all the things you've done socially at school and otherwise, you would probably be a great lawyer. And my dad, who is a real estate uh, financier and developer, said the law is a great launching uh, opportunity for you. So when I went back to Pierce, I knew that that was what I was going to do. I was going to go to law school. Uh, I wasn't um, the younger law student that was searching for uh, a path or the younger student, if you will, that was searching for a path. I, I was, uh, some accused me of being somewhat driven and I may uh, enjoy that. And sometimes I'm challenged by that. And sometimes that's a cause of some faults for me, but I was very driven to get to law school so that I could go and uh, be a lawyer. Was it always also, I wanted to make a lot of money, of course. That's what everybody was. Of course. Thinking. Of course. Uh, was it always family law from the beginning for you? Was no, that- actually, uh, family law came later in uh, terms of my orientation. Uh, when I went to law school, I really wanted to be a corporate lawyer uh, because I had a lot of connections through my family that would have uh, made greater opportunities. Um, I went to work for a small law firm in Van Nuys, and then I was candidated to join another law firm in Van Nuys uh, about halfway through. Like many of us, when you first start law, you know, you kind of do whatever the boss says you have to do. And we were a smaller, uh, full service uh, law firm uh, in Van Nuys, serving the San Fernando Valley predominantly. And I was given all of the cases that none of the partners wanted. And that, but we still wanted to keep our fingers in that in that arena. So I did a lot of family law. I did some workers' comp law. Uh, I did some construction law, and um, just kind of whatever walked in the door. And the partner said, "Here, Tommy will do it. Have him do it." And then about four years in, I announced to uh, the partners that I wanted to become a certified family law specialist. And I already had enough trials, and so I took the exam. They were supportive of that decision because I had been very uh, instrumental in helping to lead the firm technologically, like saying, oh, gee, in 1982, I think lawyers, 83 maybe, I think lawyers should have computers on their desks. And uh, everybody said, oh, no, that's not a good idea because they'll think you're a secretary. And I said, oh, not only do I want a computer, but I want a cell phone. Uh, because I had a case with Steve Kolodny, he had a cell phone. So I thought, well, if it's good enough for Steve Kolodny, I got to have one of these too. So I convinced them to, uh, I would buy the phone if they paid the bill, because I knew how expensive the bill was going to be back in the day. So there was support for me to becoming uh, family law focused. And I was focused on family law, uh, mostly because I uh, felt that it gave me more opportunity to help people in need, help people in need. One of my mentors, uh, had left a very successful uh, law practice to be uh, administrator at a church and then later to help work with organizations that were trying to help some of the Eastern Bloc nations as they migrated towards democracy to help them write their constitutions. Harvard graduate, undergrad, Harvard Law, uh, telling me, you know, who is your neighbor? Uh, a very important question asked by a lawyer. Uh, um, And the answer that was given is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Who is my neighbor? My neighbor is the person in need. And I kind of had a transformation of heart, felt that that's where I needed to put my effort to help people in need. And I think that's what we do. I think that's part of the great high calling of family law is helping people in crisis and in need. So I was very motivated about that. Were, were the partners supportive of you shifting your focus to full-time family law? Well, after I helped them figure out that they needed an IBM uh, uh, PC with double floppy disks, you know, and a really small memory, um, <laughs> Uh, I think an, I think ants hold a higher memory RAM than some of those old IBM computers did. Uh, yes, they were supportive, uh, and I, it was a blessing to me that they were supportive. But um, I, I obviously don't have to go down the rabbit trail of well, what if they weren't supportive? Because they were, they were very supportive. So, so where? Oh, go ahead, Dan. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I before we pivot, I want to he- any key moments or cases 
from that period of your life that still stick with you all these years later? There are several. Um, when I was a very young lawyer, uh, I represented um, a, a young man who was getting a divorce. And um, I want to say it's maybe five, eight years later, uh, we, I went on the obligatory trip that the school sent the kids to Sacramento. And so I think it was fifth grade for my son. And um, uh, a little girl came up to me and she said, um, do you remember me? And I said, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. She said, um, well, I just want you to know that um, you protected me from being abused. And um, because you fought for my other parent, uh, one of my parents was abusing me and you fought to make sure that I was protected. And of course, um, that was a tearful moment for me. Um, Another opportunity that I was blessed to have along the way in representing a client, uh, she was then the supervising judge of family law, now the uh, presiding judge of the second district, Francis Rothschild, uh, asked me, uh, and uh, Harold Cohen, as it turns out, uh, um, and Harold, I hope you watched and hope you're doing well. Um, and if you're not, I still hope you're doing well. Uh, but we kind of flipped a coin about who was going to represent this uh, young woman. And um, I won the bet. And uh, so I elected to represent her. Um, and along the way, it was an extremely difficult case. Uh, threats by the dad, threats to harm my family, lawsuits against me. Uh, all kinds of complaints to the state bar about me and to the judge. And then I get appointed as a judge. And um, uh, uh, my clerk comes in and says, there's a young woman on the phone. She, her name is, and she wants to know if you remember her. And I said, well, I do remember her very well. Please put her through immediately. And so we got on the phone and she said, do you remember me? And I said, well, I do remember you. And she said, I just wanted to thank you for protecting me and enduring uh, the challenges that you faced. And I wanted to let you know that because of you, I became a lawyer. Wow. Wow. And so, of course, that was an extremely meaningful day. Uh, to me. Um, along the way, I represented lots of uh, victims of domestic violence. I represented a woman who was a clerk of the court to um, the uh, Romanian Supreme Court, and there was a nullity proceeding. Uh, she had no money. Uh, she was making $800 a month in US dollars as a research attorney for the Supreme Court of Romania in equivalent US money. And um, the person who had led me along the way, Sam, uh, asked me, would you represent her? And of course I did. And um, uh, along the way, she had no money to pay me, but she sent me this beautiful, beautiful hand-painted uh, icon. Uh, and um, that uh, stayed in my office for many, many years. And then I uh, gave it to my son uh, um, some years ago. So those stand out from a professional wow. point of view. Uh, I think that some highlights in my career mostly had to do with the legislative efforts of the San Fernando Valley Bar Association, which I was honored to be president of. Uh, but prior to that um, and earlier, the bar associations, and while they still are active with the Conference of Delegates, it just didn't, doesn't have quite the same impact that it did back then. So through the Valley Bar Association, I helped participate in the uh, crafting of the automatic temporary restraining orders, uh, the law that mandated that there be an insurance uh, wage assignment, uh, the law that provided for uh, counseling uh, for families in high conflict custody cases. And um, then also along the way, I had the opportunity to 
uh, participate in a case that found its way all the way to the United States Supreme Court involving uh, religious freedom, uh, marriage of Weiss, uh, which sometimes gets cited still today. Uh, Mentry mostly gets cited on the issue of uh, religious freedom and parents becoming involved. So those were some highlights. And the biggest highlight, though, was my opportunities that were created for me to serve uh, through the Valley Bar Association, through the State Bar. Uh, I worked on some uh, committees with others like Leslie Shear to help uh, make proposals about the joint custody law. So I have been uh, very honored and blessed to have so many opportunities. But the way that many of the opportunities came for me were through activities in the Bar Association and not a shill for Beverly Hills Bar or any <laughs> bar, just saying, uh, if you're a younger lawyer, if you're looking for a way to have meaning in your practice, you can find meaning and networking through bar association activities. I, I count those as uh, some of the most significant opportunities that I've had uh, in my entire career. And I've been blessed to have lots of opportunities. Just wanted to jump in. I wanted to ask you about your experience on Marriage of Weiss. What was it like working on that case at the time? Well, it was um, it was a difficult case uh, because, uh, of course, I was supportive of what I represented the mom in that yeah, case. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. So context? the backstory is I represented the mom and uh, the mom and the dad it was a, a Mom married a Jewish doctor, and she was not Jewish. Uh, she signed a ketubah, promised to raise their son Jewish. Then they separate, and now she wants to take the boy to church, and there was a whole controversy about that. And while I was very supportive of what the dad wanted to accomplish, I felt that there were First Amendment issues involved, and um, so we pursued protecting uh, those First Amendment claims, even though uh, maybe I didn't completely agree with what the mom was trying to do, because frankly, I thought she should honor her promise. Uh, um, but we we tried the case. Uh, offers were made to settle, which I won't talk about, uh, to protect the privacy of that family. Uh, and the trial court uh, acknowledged that the dad could not force uh, um, the religious issue through the court system. And um, so uh, along the way, it became burdensome economically for the client. And um, our firm decided to underwrite the costs of uh, defending it uh, up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court did not grant cert. We actually wanted the Supreme Court to grant cert because we thought that religious freedom issues should be subject to the strict scrutiny test rather than the rational basis test. Uh, there's a dig back to uh, constitutional law for many of us. And um, uh, um, we felt that that was uh, the most important way uh, to handle that. So, so, so let's, uh, it, after all this, especially on the, the activism side and your commitment to, to, to helping, truly helping people, seems like a natural evolution to become a judge. And I know you started out doing pro tem work first. I did. Right? So yes. as, as you dip your toe into the, the judicial waters, let's say, uh, how, how did you first get into that? And, and sure. how did that evolve um, into opportunities to join the bench uh, along the way? Okay, well, um, that's a lot. So let me try to uh, give you some of the high points. Uh, early on in my career, I was uh, invited to uh, be active in the um, San Fernando Valley Bar Association. And the San Fernando Valley Bar Association uh, really was uh, among the first leaders to have a daily settlement officer program. Uh, in the Van Nuys court, and then later to also help populate it for the San Fernando court, now Chatsworth, uh, when it opened. So um, helping people find peaceful resolution is the core value to me. Um, you know, somebody I respect a lot uh, is known for having, having said, blessed are the peacemakers. 
And so I find a lot of blessing in trying to help people find a peaceful resolution rather than what I call retreating to litigation. Uh, and so uh, I started working as a daily settlement officer, even though I was young, and I, but I was very motivated and passionate, something I've been accused of more than once. And I hope I continue to be accused of that. Um, and so I started working as a daily settlement officer. And then back in the day, there wasn't all the restriction of 10 years of practice to serve as a judge pro tem. And the Valley, uh, uh, many members of the Valley Bar uh, were asked to serve as judge pro tem in Van Nuys and in San Fernando. And so I started doing that very early in my career and continued to do it. Uh, and very regularly. And then I was asked to start doing pro tem work in uh, Ventura County. Uh, at the time that they opened up the Simi court, they had uh, some pro, uh, pro per days and the calendars were usually 20 to 30 matters uh, per day. So I started pro teming there and I, I really liked it a lot. Um, uh, and what did you like about it? Well, I liked the opportunity to try to find uh, solutions to problems and help find solutions to problems. So, um, and two people, the most influential people uh, in my adult life, uh, my absolute best friend in the whole world, my dear wife, uh, she said, you're going to be a judge one day. And my dearest and closest friend, a guy named Dwight, said to me, Tom, one day you're going to be a judge. And this is like 1987-ish. A, a year or so later, uh, I was honored to be asked to put my application in to go on the municipal court. And I was not interested in being a municipal court judge, not because there's anything demeaning about that high calling and that important uh, profession, it just wasn't going to put me in a family law assignment. So I just was not interested. Mm -hmm. And plus the money was pretty uh, puny. And I had young kids and I was raising a family and, you know, I wanted to provide opportunities for them that would be more accessible through the income uh, and blessings of being in private practice. And so I uh, declined that opportunity. And then uh, a little later, around 2005, uh, I was uh, asked, would I be willing to put my application in to be a judge? And um, I said, yes. And um, uh, so we went from application in June to appointment uh, in the following February with some very interesting, Sarah, go ahead, Dan, you want to ask? Oh, no, I was going to ask, I think a lot of us aren't necessarily entirely familiar of what that actual process entailed. I didn't want to blow through that. So, sure. so, so from application to appointment, just give normally us a it's about a one to two year process. And uh, for me, it was about, well, uh, I like to tell the story. Um, some call it serendipity. I call it something different than serendipity. Uh, so when I put my application in, we put it in on my wife's birthday, June 10th. Yeah, Because I always wanted to remember that if I got appointed, that I could always mark that date uh, as significant because it was my wife that A, was supportive, and B, knew that we were going to make sacrifices if I left uh, to join public service because it is public service. And um, so we put the application in on June 10th. And then through the process, uh, the governor's office can bypass the Jenny Commission, judicial nominations and evaluation, uh, uh, commonly called Jenny. Uh, 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 but that that's rarely, rarely done. And so the soonest date that the governor could have appointed me was almost exactly on my birthday, uh, December 17th. And um, so then um, I don't want to go too much into the details, but I was reassured that um, the governor would probably be looking favorably on my application the following year, because uh, towards kind of the holidays, if you will, like so many things, you know, government kinds of shuts down right around uh, the 1st of December. And um, although not so much anymore, but back then it did 06, 05, 06. And so um, roll around the first of the year, 
um, I'm at a bar association meeting uh, and I get a phone call or I'm there and a judge who uh, I think has since passed on said, good for you, Tommy. If you get appointed, you'll live a lot longer. I don't know if that's true, but the following morning, I got the phone call from the governor's office. And when that call came in, actually, um, uh, the appointment secretary is on the phone and I can hear him, but he can't hear me. And um, so I'm going, yes, yes, yes. And he goes, I can't hear a thing. I don't know what to do. And then uh, I'm going, oh, my goodness, there goes my appointment, all because of Ma Bell or whoever was handling the phones at the time. And um, so uh, next thing you know, uh, I get told, uh, oh, they're on the phone again. And so the appointment comes and my appointment was to originally be uh, effective March the 6th of 2006. And then about four days later, I get a phone call from the governor's office. And we just want to let you know that the governor has decided, by the way, I did not ask for this. Uh, the governor has decided that your appointment date is going to be March the 5th, which is my daughter Jennifer's birthday. So I'm sure that for many of us, it's just a pure coincidence that all three of those dates happen to line up the way that they did. And trust me that I ain't making that up. Uh, <laughs> it's too good to have, for me to have figured out to make something like that up. So uh, that was the process. Normally it's a much longer process. Uh, for those who want to seek a judicial appointment, I would say build your resume with public service now. Mm. And you can do that, by the way, through bar association activities, through other organizations like the Los Angeles Center for Law and Justice or Harriet Buhai or Levitt and Quinn. Find ways to serve vast, the less fortunate vast. and give back. <laughs> Um, and so once you were appointed and you started your family law assignment, um, at what point did you decide to pursue a leadership role? Well, of course, I was naive enough, arrogant enough and dumb enough that when I went on the bench that I thought, well, I must know a lot about being a judge and gee, I should be in leadership. And then as I got closer and saw what was involved, I was less interested in leadership. Uh, when I was interviewed to be supervising judge, well, first assistant supervising judge, and then supervising judge, uh, I made it clear, I don't need this assignment. And when I was appointed as supervising judge, I made it very clear uh, to uh, Judge Buckley, I said, I don't need to be supervising judge. And he said, I know you don't need to be. That's why you'll be a good one. And um, no criticism of anybody else who wanted to be supervising judge and didn't become supervising judge. But it's a hard job. Uh, all of those that want to be, you know, critical of past supervising judges, um, it's easy to be critical. It's a lot harder to do the job. And uh, leading strong-willed, independent people. The key to leadership amongst lawyers and judges, in my opinion, is collaborative leadership. Uh, you should be listening to the voice of uh, your constituents and not simply going on with, you know, believing that you have all the answers. Those are the most dangerous people. And I'm guilty of that sometimes too, thinking that I have the best answers. You made a lot of strides in modernizing the court when you were the supervising judge. Uh, what, what do you think uh, that, that legacy, how do you see those, those strides now, especially what we've been through over the last year and how the court has developed since you left? Well, so let's not give me the credit for the court becoming uh, it, um, electronically sensitive, but I can say it goes way back for me, my dedication to that, uh, me arguing with the partners about the fact that lawyers need to have computers on their desks, me saying, hey, we need to have technology. Hey, I need a pager that can send me a, te a text message. Um, so I've always been a fan, uh, uh, technology fan. I think I'm well known amongst those who can still remember it, uh, uh, that I was carrying around a Toshiba laptop, which in 19, uh, I don't know, 85, 
I think it costs $3,000 for a 20 pound laptop computer because I felt that lawyers needed to have computers with them. So when I went on as supervising judge, it was already planned that family law was going to become the next discipline to really go electronic. So I was completely stoked about that. I just thought, man, I just can't wait to get involved in that. But I'm not the one that did it. I just had the honor of being the encourager to everyone that we could make this transition and that it would be a transition that would be for the good. And I think that's been especially so. Um, of course, I'm also the one that kept saying, don't worry, e-filing is right around the corner. I have had to wipe egg off of my face for years. Even now I'm wiping a little off now. You can't see it because of the makeup, but um, uh E-filing hasn't happened yet, but let me say the reason, the main reason that we're not truly fully ready for e-filing, and it'll happen eventually uh, in family law, is because the technology has to be more robust. And um, so, yes, when family law division of the Los Angeles Superior Court uh, became electronic, it was the largest single court system in the world to migrate to an electronic platform. But Tom Lewis is not the one that made that happen. Tom Lewis was just honored to be in a leadership role along the way with great technical people and a motivated bench. The credit doesn't go to me. The credit goes to the on the line judge judges who said, let's adapt. Let's get into the 21st century, albeit a little late into the 21st century, one might argue, but nevertheless in the 21st century. And um, so I just consider that all of the early stuff that I was devoted to were, built the stepping stones to achieving uh, an electronic court along the way. Well, while we're on the topic of uh, technology in the court, what do you think about the remote litigation practice that has sort of uh, emerged out of nowhere with the pandemic? Well, I think that, uh, I think that there are opportunities uh, in, you know, uh, it was, I believe actually Marcus Aurelius, not Rob Emanuel, when he was working for President Clinton, who said, never lose the opportunity of a great crisis. I believe Marcus Aurelius said that, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> maybe he stole it from somebody else, who knows? But um, I think that we have, seen opportunities uh, through uh, the, uh, the, in the Zoom era, if you will. Um, I'll call it that for want of a better way of calling it. And um, so I think that some of what has changed is here to stay, but there are, there's nothing like being in a live courtroom. It's hard to read the room on Zoom, but at least you're in a room. Uh, it's hard to do a mediation in Zoom, harder to do a mediation in Zoom. Uh, but at least you're doing it. It's harder to judge pro tem when it's Zoom, but at least you are helping parties move their case forward. The Sisyphus effect of rolling the rock up the hill and having the rock roll back over you that has challenged all of our lives in this last year. Uh, there have been some and many who have innovated and are ready for the innovation. And I'm honored and pleased to say you know, I'm one of those people and very thankful for the opportunity to participate through the Zoom platform. So I want to pivot a little bit yeah. um, and, and, and go into our legal topic for this. Yes, week. yes. In your time on the bench, really over your whole career, and you've given us a great sense of it going back to the Taft days, uh, you've lived through a lot of changed attitudes, especially around social roles and gender roles, and of course, the law itself. But one of the things I know you're personally passionate about are the shifts and the progression that we've made around domestic violence law. Yes. So, well, the most back, significant right? change, the most yeah. significant change is not domestic violence. The most significant change is same sex marriage being recognized in the United States. That is the most significant change, um, uh, recognizing the right to uh, equality. Uh, for same-sex marriage, as I like to uh, sometimes cynically say, doesn't matter what your plumbing is, you have the right to be as happy or as miserable as the rest of us. <laughs> and um, so um, I think that's the most significant change. But truly, there's been very significant 
change on a uh, uh, big level in the area of domestic violence. Uh, when I started practicing law, it was extremely hard to get an uh, order of protection, extremely hard. You really had to show, and judges would say this, where's the blood? Where's the uh, most recent ooh. act of physical violence? Uh, back in the day of wanting to take pictures of a client who had bruises on her neck and being told, no, I'm, I'm too afraid of what will happen. Uh, arguing that we should have counseling for uh, families to help, you know, de-escalate the conflict. And then having a uh, wonderful person, uh, Sheila Kuehl, come to me and say, you know, I'm not sure we can support this legislation because it doesn't deal with the issue of domestic violence. Now, mind you, this is like 88. And I say, well, what does that have to do with it? And of course, it just showed how dumb I was, um, but since uh, largely educated in the area. So there's been a major shift away from just looking for physical violence. And I have been saying for many years that we need to, we need to change the name of the act, actually. Uh, the Domestic Violence Prevention Act should be called the Domestic Abuse Prevention Act, the Domestic Abuse Prevention Act, because the definition of abuse includes physical violence, but it's much more than that, as we see from Nad Carney, uh, really the watershed case that came down and said that abuse can be emotional abuse, uh, it can be disturbing the peace, not as defined by Penal Code Section 415, and um, so uh, that was a major paradigm shift. And even though it was right there in the statute, you know, we make so many changes because a court of appeals said, hey guys, and, and women read the statute, you know? And so we read the statute and we see that abuse is more than physical violence. And then of course, along the way, being active in organizations, which I strongly urge people to be active in, like ACFLS, Association of Certified Family Law Specialists, AFCC, California Chapter, Association of Family and Conciliation Courts, also an organization that I was blessed to have a uh, leadership role in, we began to talk more about coercive control. I had the opportunity to teach with Evan Stark in Denver, uh, I want to say a decade ago, almost, little less, uh, little less than a decade ago, where he had written a book about coercive control. And, you know, everybody was going, well, what's that? And then, of course, we now have it incorporated into our statute, incorporated into our law. So I have been a passionate advocate for rec teaching judges and lawyers that abuse is something more than physical violence. And and Oh, yes, I'm sorry. sorry. Lauren. What, are, what are your thoughts on that change, um, that recent change in our in our statute defining coercive control and specifically calling it out as an act of abuse? Well, I think that it's subject to being abused as well. Um, and it's like so many things, um, uh, you know, what are the limitations? Uh, one of the things that I was honored to do along the way was teach to the Court of Appeal uh, um, several times invited as a superior court judge to come and talk to them about family law issues. And I said, we need you when you affirm a trial court for not granting a restraining order, we need you guys to publish and women too. Of course, I use guys as the gender neutral. I don't know if that's okay anymore, but I'm using it. So if I offend anybody, apologies. Um, so uh, I said, we need to get some published opinions that say that's not abuse. The trial court said it's not abuse. It's the strategic use. There was a non-pub decision some years ago that said this DV application was the strategic use of the Domestic Violence Prevention Act to gain leverage on issues of child custody and support. And they wouldn't publish the opinion. Now, why? Now, since we have some published opinions that tell us trial court, that was okay. You didn't issue a restraining order. It's too early to tell. The addition in the statute is important because there's still a lot of bias against victims of domestic violence that, well, get over it, or what's the matter with you, or how come you're not strong enough to stand up to that person? That has to stop. But Along with that, we have to recognize that it is subject to some abuse. We won't know whether or not the change in the statute uh, was 
positive or negative until we get some more published opinions. By the way, if you do a survey of the cases involving DV, there's coercive control all over the place. In all the, almost all of the main published cases, uh, Evil Sizer versus Sweeney, couldn't make those names up if you wanted to. Um, in that case, there was a tremendous amount of coercive control. In some of the other cases, making you leave your cell phone on uh, so I can listen to who you're talking to when you go to school. If that's not coercive control, I don't know what is. We know what it is when we see it. The question is going to be how well is it articulated by trial courts and eventually by the Court of Appeal. Uh, so I think it's a good change, but it is a change that does come with some risk. For instance, if you are the profligate spender and your spouse cuts off your credit card because you won't stop spending, is that abuse or is that just good money management? Uh, on the other hand, taking away all of your ability to buy anything, controlling you with money, by the way, we recognize controlling you with money in the area of elder abuse. And now I think we can recognize it in the area of family law too. We are late to the game by the way, when it comes to recognizing coercive control as a form of abusive behavior, uh, to the shame of California to be so uh, late to the game and recognize that. Do you think that there's sufficient um, education and training for judicial officers on the family law bench in California about this topic and, and how to recognize coercive control as something more than just something to get over, as you mentioned before, be dismissed? Well, sure. And so, you know, it is the mantra commonly of family law lawyers to lament that the judges don't get adequate training. And um, to which I would say, uh, agree with you, they need more training, and they need consistent training. Uh, I know in Los Angeles County, one of the back office things that we did was to provide for more training for bench officers as they came on to the bench. Uh, and so it, is there, that's like saying, is there enough uh, COVID vaccine? No, there is not enough COVID vaccine. We need more COVID vaccine. There are lots of people that are at risk for infection. And we, do we need more training in this area? We need constant, vigilant, continuous, progressive efforts to educate the bar and the bench. Because remember, the lawyers can help reinforce negative stereotypes into the ears of a bench officer who perhaps is not familiar with family law. And then we reap the consequences, uh, if you will, socially, uh, by reinforcing negative stereotypes. Oh, and I'm sorry for this uh, characterization of it. Oh, she's just whining. Uh, sorry, but that's not whining. That's complaining about being abused. So quit calling it whining. And by the way, it's a sexist word. So don't use it uh, unless you're describing Chardonnay uh, um, but, uh, or Pinot for that matter. Um, but um, yeah, there's a need for more training. Uh, and lawyers too, quite frankly, uh, need to break out of the habit of thinking everything is DV because strategically it might advance my client's interest to nothing is DV because that advances my client's interest. Um, uh, and lawyers, I think the biggest thing lawyers could change is uh, serious advocacy without embroilment. And being zealous doesn't mean being embroiled. Uh, civility and professionalism, especially in areas involving domestic violence, where it doesn't become a cluster of grapes, if you will, because everybody is so embroiled in uh, either you falsely accused me or uh, uh, I am victimized by every move you make, everything you say, every uh, uh, thing you file is abusive, abusive, abusive. Uh, so balance, 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 as always. Where do you want to see the law go next? What to you is the next, what's on the horizon or the next frontier, either in reforming the, the new law once we see how it shakes out or, or the, the, the evolution and development of the law going forward? I think socially we need to provide more uh, 
uh, bridge assistance to victims of domestic violence, uh, especially in um, more uh, economically disadvantaged communities. Uh, we need to have a more, uh, uh, we, have, we need to have more of us give more to organizations that help those in need. Uh, uh, being charitable to me is an important thing. Giving back is very important. Uh, I would like to see more civility amongst family law lawyers. I think that we're on kind of a death spiral of, uh, and it could be COVID related, it could be economic related, it could be orientation related. And it isn't just Southern California, by the way. Uh, uh, but uh, a greater sense of the high calling of being a lawyer. And I think it starts with us. I think that we need to respect ourselves enough to be our better selves rather than devolving, if you will, uh, or taking the bait uh, from others, which is hard. I mean, you know, if somebody is constantly in your face, it's hard not to respond in anger. Uh, but I think that the family law bar could do a better job at promoting professionalism and collegiality. I don't think it's gotten better in the last 10 years, quite frankly, and that's just not a sign of me aging or being on the bench. Uh, it's hard out there to be a family law lawyer. We could be... Uh, we could be our better selves more often. Now, there isn't, there isn't funding that's going to make that happen. It's change of heart on all of our parts uh, and not responding uh, uh, to inappropriateness, uh, trusting that the judge is going to be actually listening to the evidence and not just who's, uh, who has the um, uh, loudest voice. It's not always the loudest voice in the room that's the most wise voice. Do you think that judicial officers have a role to play in managing incivility amongst litigants? Yes. Or yes. And, and what can they do to help in those situations when, when counsel is being very uncivil or aggressive? It's harder for judges to do that today than it was uh, in an earlier era, uh, largely because uh, judicial ethics uh, um, really make it uh, unwise for judges to have chambers conferences. Uh, those are not as popular as they were once. And there were abuses in chambers conferences. Believe me, I've, I have been in chambers conferences where judges told me, your client's going to lose. And if you go out there and argue, your client's going to do worse. I've had that said to me. So I get that lawyers are sometimes worried about a judge uh, saying something like that. Don't worry, I won't say who the judge is. Uh, um, so uh, it, it's harder for judges because you start calling lawyers out and, you know, the bar starts to revolt and then there's listserv mania about, oh, this judge did that or whatever. So it's, it's not easy to be a superior court judge. Uh, some say the further up the flagpole you go, the more your rear end sticks out and, um, or the more the wind blows, depending on which metaphor you like better. Uh, so um, I think judges are sometimes cautious about that. The idea that judges are unaware or the idea that judges don't talk with other judges about how lawyers are conducting themselves in chambers and private personal conf uh, con consultation with one another about uh, the deliberative process. Uh, often the question is asked, who are the lawyers? And that that can sometimes frame the conversation. So is that still true uh, in now that you're back in private practice, essentially it's signature. And yes. as a mediator and as a private judge, is that, do you still, do you see the same problems when they're appearing in front of you that Lauren's talking about appearing in court itself? Yes. Um, uh, but I, I, I promised uh, one very dear friend that I would be true to myself when I went into private. You know, it's very easy to be worried, oh, gee, well, someone's not going to hire me if I say something that they don't like. Or, oh, gee, what if I rule against somebody? Maybe they're not going to like me. And I believe that you have to be true to yourself. And true for Tom to be true to Tom is if it calls for a hard call, then make it. If uh, it calls for uh, someone 
prevailing and someone else not prevailing, and that's what the evidence shows, then do it. And don't be afraid to speak the truth. You can do it with civility and uh, without humiliating people. And I've tried to be that guy. I know I can be tough. My wife says I've been in court and seen you. And it's like, you know, you're bigger than life, your personality. I just don't feel that way about me. Um, Because I just want to honestly and truthfully, I want to do the right thing. So if I can guide you in the direction of doing the right thing, then I want to do that and decide that, the case on the merits, not just on the personalities. Has that changed? I, we only have a couple minutes left and I want to kind of zoom all the way back out. Talked about as an attorney, as a judge, as a supervising judge, and now as a mediator and, and neutral, has your view of the law or the process, has it change? Where are you at with that now? Having sure. hit all of those uh, or, or, or have all those really wide ranging roles in, in, in the cycle of a case and engaging with the law? Sure. Well, I think that you need to always be educating yourself. And I mentioned to this uh, to you before we started that I, this last year in, well, 20, uh, in 19, uh, I attended a program at Harvard uh, University program of negotiation. Uh, in 20, I said to my wife, I think I want to enroll at Pepperdine Law School's LLM degree in uh, advanced dispute resolution. And she said, well, why do you want to do that? First of all, you'll be 72 when you graduate. I said, well, I've been telling people along the way, you need to continue to sharpen your skills and be educated, be your best self. And I'm not always my best self. Uh, but I think that the, 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 the most important thing is to thine own self be true, right? Socrates. Uh, and he probably stole it from somebody else, but he gets the credit. Uh, so I think that that's very important is to continue to stay focused and devoted to the great work that we do in the family law arena, which is to help people. And very frequently it involves protecting the vulnerable and not, um, uh, you know, the story is that Moses asked God, how do I judge my, your people? He says, show no preference to the rich and show no scorn for the poor. And those remain the balances that we still have to figure out. How do we uh, make sure that we are not showing preference to the rich, but not treating them worse and not showing scorn for the poor, but not treating them better? And, and finding that balance, that's a day-to-day -day thing. And staying educated, stay motivated, and be your best self. That's what it's all about to me. And still is. I think more uh, today, that's... More today than ever before. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely a perfect note for us to wrap up on exactly at 1.30. I know we talked about uh, making this a seven-hour program <laughs> earlier, <laughs> but... <laughs> I think we'll stick to what we advertised uh, Absolutely. and call it. Thank you so much, Judge Lewis, for uh, right. sharing your Thank you all. God bless you. everybody. And everybody yes. stay safe and well. And I hope to see you in person soon. Thank you. And one, one last note for everyone who's still listening. Please mark your calendars and join us uh, for our next programs on June 2nd with Ann Kiley and July 7th with Judge Riff and August 4th with Dana Lowy and Doreen Olson. It's all at 12.30 p.m. And registration links are posted on the BHBA calendar and in the chat right here. Um, thank you to Genna and Alex at the bar, the Family Law Executive Committee led by Carrie Holmes and Ron Reitschein. And of course, as we said, our, our section sponsors. Um, thank you again, Judge Lewis, and have a great rest of the week, everyone. Thank I'll you. add, I do pity that professor that calls on you uh, <laughs> in your classes using the Socrat, trying to surprise you. That's, uh, I, I really pity that. Well, I'll tell you what I said to them just because it's it'd take two, 20 seconds. Yeah. I said, I don't want to be Judge Lewis. I just want to be <laughs> Tom Lewis. I'm not here to be Judge Lewis. I'm here to be a student. I'm here to learn. I don't want any special recognition. I don't need that. I don't want it. It's not good for me. I'm here to learn. Well, so I hope you can wash that off when you go into the classroom. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.